Your eyes open spiritual doors to your life. There are two major gates into the life of every one of us, the ear gate and the eye gate. These are not the only gates, but they are the two primary ones. What you subject your ears to hear and your eyes to see will determine who you will eventually turn out to become. Our focus today is, however, on the eye gate and how it opens spiritual doors in our lives. Our eyes are a gate that leads to our hearts and our spiritual lives. Whatever you feed your eyes with will determine the quality of your spiritual life. Do you know that children learn faster by sight? Whatever they see their parents do is what they will begin to do. Their hearts are configured to work according to what they see. The majority of children see clearly before they can speak fluently. So, children typically relate with life through their sight. More seriously is the fact that what we see physically can permeate into our spiritual life and corrupt our spirituality. Anyone who can guard and discipline his or her heart would have automatically protected his or her heart from being polluted. There is an undeniable, unquestionable, unequivocal link to the human eye and the human mind. There is an undeniable, unquestionable, unequivocal link to the human eye and the human heart. The lust of the eyes was what led to the fall of man in the Garden of Eden. If Eve had disciplined her eyes, she wouldn't have eaten the forbidden fruit. The Bible says that she saw the fruit was good for food and desirable to make one wise. The forbidden fruit was not good until she saw it that way. The lust of the eye will make something evil to appear good to a person. There is great affinity between our eyes and our hearts, and we need to be conscious of that. Time and time again, we see themes of great men and great women who have fallen because of what they saw. Let the Bible record speak. In Joshua 7, we see an act of disobedience causing the Israelites to be defeated by the citizens of Ai. Achan disobeyed God by stealing things that God specifically announced through his servant Joshua were cursed objects. Their loss to the citizens of Ai troubled Joshua greatly, and he began searching throughout the Israelite camp for the one responsible. His search led him to Achan. Joshua 7, 19 through to 21. And Joshua said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel, and make confession unto him. And tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. Now look at the first three words in verse 21. When I saw. When I what? When I saw. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. His actions of disobedience that directly led to the death of 36 men started because of what he saw. 36 families were affected because of the sin of one man, and it all started with his eyes. Look at verse 21. There is a clear progression and elevation of sin. He saw, he coveted, he took, and he hid. Where else in the Bible do we see this same progression of sin? We see it in the life of David. 2 Samuel 11.2 And it came to pass in an evening tide, that David arose from off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. David saw a woman taking a bath while he was at the housetop, and he couldn't look away. 
He processed that thought in his heart until that singular sight led him into adultery and murder. Although David had several wives at the time, lust of the eye would not allow him to be satisfied with his wives. What was it that Bathsheba had that the wives of David did not possess? People who cannot discipline themselves on what they watch will eventually end up acting foolish and putting themselves in big trouble. Your eyes can put you in trouble, but before they do, you can stop them. It is amazing how Jesus connected what we do with our sight with fornication and adultery in Matthew 5, 27 and 28, which says, Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. In the Old Testament, the law only prosecuted those that are caught in the act of adultery or fornication or other forms of immorality. Back then, if an adulterer is not caught with evidence, then he or she is free from the law. Again, in the Old Testament, there was nothing said about the lust of eyes, which is the foundation for the committal of sexual sins. However, Jesus came to repeal this law by saying that a person is not only guilty when he or she indulges in the very act of sexual immorality, but that heaven takes into account the very moment he or she begins to look lustfully at a woman or man, as the case may be. So, sexual immorality is birthed, first of all, by a lustful sight. No one can commit sexual immorality in his or her heart without, first of all, having a lustful sight. So the discipline of your eyes is very important if we are going to secure our spiritual lives. You have an eyelid so that you can shut your eyes from evil sights. The decision to look at or look away is always yours and mine. And we are going to give account for what we do with that liberty. Every one of us have to discipline ourselves, like Job, to make a covenant of purity with our eyes. Job 31.1 I made a covenant with mine eyes. Why then should I think upon a maid? Any man that does not adopt the discipline of Job will mess himself up, especially in this extremely corrupt generation. Any woman that does not adopt the discipline of Job will mess herself up, especially in this extremely corrupt generation. Take accountability for your eyes. You are in control. You are in charge. I think we need the discipline of Job in our time more than it was needed in their time. Everywhere you go nowadays, you are just bombarded with the lust of the eyes, shops, colleges, airports. Both Christian men and women need to discipline their eyes. We must make a covenant with our eyes. Jesus knew what it implies if we will have to fight the battle of our sight in order to overcome immoral sins when he said in Matthew 5.29, And if thy right eye offend thee, pluck it out, and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish, and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. Jesus does not mean that we should blindfold our physical eyes. He was referring to the spiritual discipline to which we must place our eyes. Instead of giving pleasure to your eyes by watching pornographic videos, it is better to deny your eyes than to have the whole of your body cast into hell. Dear husband, you are only to have eyes for your wife. Dear wife, you are only to have eyes for your husband. If David had satisfied himself with his wives, he wouldn't have brought so much troubles upon his life that he experienced. After fighting a lot of battles, he had no peace in his home because of his lust. The consequences of not disciplining our eyes outweigh the pleasures we think we will derive by giving pleasures to them. As a man, when you begin to look outside your home for another woman, then you are set to pierce your heart with a lifetime of sorrow. 
The Bible already establishes that the reward of immorality is wounds and dishonor. We must discipline our eyes before it gets us into trouble. Be faithful in your marriage. Stay faithful in your marriage. Ephesians 5, 22, 25. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. The devil is after the family and the family structure. One of his weapons against it is unfaithfulness. The matter of faithfulness is a kingdom demand from every believer in Christ. We are expected to be faithful in all areas of our life because we shall surely give account of whatever we do in time. Out of all the areas where God demands us to be faithful today, we shall be taking a look at faithfulness in marriage, the blessings of being faithful, and also the dangers of unfaithfulness in marriage. Although the walls of faithfulness has been greatly broken in several marriages, God wants to use the Christian family to rebuild it and make everyone to come to the understanding that it is very possible to be faithful in marriage. The Bible is our constitution as believers. Any law or policy that is against biblical standards for our marriages are not to be imbibed. Adultery and extramarital affairs may be celebrated in our society, but we must not join the multitudes to act against what the Bible says about our marriage and home. As far as the issue of faithfulness in marriage is concerned, no member of the family is left out. Although it starts with the husband and wife, but as soon as children are born into the family, they are also obliged to be faithful. The husband, who is the father of the house, is obligated by God to be faithful to his wife and to his children. The wife, who is the mother of the home, is expected also to be faithful to her husband and her children. As the children grow, they are to be taught how to be faithful, beginning from childhood till they grow into adulthood and raise a family of their own. One of the reasons there are a lot of failed marriages and divorces today is that parents failed to be faithful in their marriages and that trait has been transferred to their children. Your children are observing you. Fathers, the way you treat your wife is your daughter's first and closest example of how she should be treated. You are the number one primary example of a man in her life. And whether you like it or not, that what she sees you acting like will affect her to some extent. Do your children see you not being faithful in your marriage? Is that the example you're setting? The Bible says that in marriage, the husband and the wife are no longer two entities but one. If this is true, then it means that every husband is expected to see his wife not as a separate entity, but as one with him. And the wife is supposed to see her husband as part of herself. Marriage is in itself a covenant of faithfulness. If you are not ready to be committed to being faithful, then there is no reason to have married in the first place. If God demands us all to be faithful to our bosses and leaders who are not one with us, how much more he demands faithfulness to our spouses to whom we are joined together. Husbands, you have a covenant with your wives, and it is the covenant of faithfulness. If you break it, you will be guilty of God. Your headship as a man over your family is divinely ordained and must not be taken for granted. You will give an account to God how you handled your marriage. Remember that marriage is a divine institution whose headmaster is God. Do you leave your wife and children at home and care less about how they feel and live? Do you have extramarital affairs? Do your children have joy of fatherhood? These are your responsibilities as a man and you must be faithful to them. Here is another responsibility. Are you providing for your home? The Bible says 1 Timothy 5, 8, But if any provide not for his own, and specially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. These are God's words, not mine. Yes, in life sometimes people have health issues, and they are unable to provide. Or 
They are let go by a company, and for a period of time they are unable to provide. Paul isn't talking about them. He is referring to those who can and have the opportunity to do so and choose not. Wives, you committed yourself to be faithful to your marriage the day you accepted to spend your life with your husband. How true are you to that commitment? Are you faithful to your husband? Is your husband troubled to return home after rigorous work because of your attitude? Are your children happy to have you as their mom? God is the referee of your home and he sees all that you do. If you are keeping secrets from your spouse, then you are not faithful. The Bible says that the two, both the husband and his wife, shall become one flesh. No matter what argument or excuse we think we have against this, it is unscriptural and unacceptable. Hebrews 13.4 Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed is undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. This is a biblical warning. We need to stop ignoring it. Husbands and wives, God will judge all adulterers. Please stay faithful. In my opinion, it is harder for people to stay faithful now. Since the creation of social media and technology, I have seen men and women leave their spouse because a high school sweetheart messaged them on social media and old feelings came flooding back in. Or you see young couples having issues in their marriage because the husband is comparing his wife to an Instagram model. The truth is, those people aren't real, and if they are, they get paid to look that way. Personally, when I got married, I completely removed myself from social media. You may say that is a drastic step, but my marriage is important to me. Why do I need to be seeing what other people post in their pictures and so on? Social media may not be a trigger point for you, but you know what the area the enemy tries to tempt you to be unfaithful. You see some husbands doing their best to present themselves as a single man. You are not single. Behave like a husband. You see wives presenting themselves as if they are a single young lady. You are not a single young lady. Behave like a wife. You can't behave the same way you did when you were single. You hear people say, I am going to get married, but I am not going to let it change me or my life. It better change you, honey. If you buy a dog, it will change your life. Even if you get a goldfish, it will change your life. How much more should becoming one with another person change your life? Stop acting single. God commands husbands to love their wives, and he commands wives to submit to their husbands. Then he commands children to obey and honor their parents, while parents also are to love their children and not provoke them to anger. Every party in the family has a responsibility and instruction to be faithful in the family, and each party must keep their parts to avoid being judged by God. 